On a microscopic level, they exist to kill. They travel, they attack, they hide, they even gather together in defense maneuvers. Pathogens are the enemies of every member of the healthcare team. On Pathogens and PPE, we give you the tools you need to fight these threats and win. So sit back, tune in, and let's make these microbes tremble at the sound of your name. Welcome back, everybody. We are here for episode two of the Pathogens and PPE podcast. And this episode is focused on the different types of pathogens, all about bacteria, viruses, fungus, all of the good stuff. I'm here in the studio with Michael Matthews, and I am Jill Holtzworth, the Infection Prevention Manager at Emory University Hospital Midtown in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm going to ask Michael to give you a little bit about himself. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Michael Matthews. I'm the Director of Customer Education and Training for Agility. Um, my background is in sterile processing, which is right up the alley for this podcast. So I'm excited to talk about this. Awesome. And we have two great guests in the studio today. We have Patrick Gordon and Jerry Colbertson, and we will be right back with an awesome episode. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back, everybody. We are here for episode number two of the Pathogens and PPE podcast. This is all about different types of pathogens. We are going to go over bacteria, viruses, fungus, all sorts of fun things. And I have in the studio today my co-host, Michael, and we have two special guests, Jerry and Patrick. I'm going to ask them to give a little bit about themselves. So, Patrick, why don't you go first? Thanks, Jill. My name is Patrick Gordon, the Director of Infection Control at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Over the past eight years in infection control, I've done quite a bit of work in perioperative services and CPD, so happy to join you today. Awesome. Glad to have you. And Jerry. My name is Jerry Culbertson. I am a registered nurse out of Santa Clara Valley Medical Center in San Jose, California. My experience has primarily been, you know, starting back in the Army with being what we called then an OR tech. And that would mean that we would work with the sterile instruments and perform during the surgery as well as take care of the instruments afterwards. That evolved into a variety of nursing careers to which I spent some time in the OR and then I oversaw sterile processing as well as a department. So it's my favorite place to be. Awesome. Well, glad to have you both. Thank you all for being here. And today, I just want to start off with talking about the differences between bacteria and viruses. And I know that we, we say these words a lot, and they are very different. So let's just Talk a little bit about some of the characteristics of bacteria and viruses. And Patrick, do you want to try and tackle this one first? So, so bacteria and viruses, I think we talk about them a lot in the same sentence and we confuse them a lot of what it really means. I think the high level really we can think about bacteria as being single cell organisms. They live on their own. They don't need a host to survive. They're something that can live in the environment for different areas. They live in soil. They live in air. They live in water versus viruses are things that we know they need a host cell to survive. So when we think about the viruses, they are something that infects us or other living beings and they replicate with the cells of that living being to reproduce. And so when we think about them from a prevention standpoint, we think about them from a treatment standpoint and what it means to us, they're two very different things even though we put them in the same sentence. So as we're talking about CPD, the things we think about when it comes to surgical services. We talk about bacteria a lot, surgical site infections, things that we see there, uh, disinfection of surfaces, disinfection of equipment. We're thinking a lot about bacteria, but we really can't forget about viruses, specifically bloodborne pathogen viruses such as hepatitis viruses. Those are ones that we need to keep in the back of our mind 
We're never going to see them show up on a micro report for an SSI, but the work that we do to prevent the transmission of them is really key from start to finish. So it's something that we don't hear a lot about in our SSI surveillance processes, but really important for us to keep there that there's different things we need to do to prevent those from transmitting. Yeah, and that's a helpful overview, Patrick. And I, I think one of the questions that that people run into sometimes in distinguishing between the two is is what's necessary for each of those to survive and live. And so could you give us kind of a rundown maybe just of you already told us that a virus needs a host to live and I'm this is a podcast you can't see me doing bunny quotes around the word live but if you could kind of let us know like what is necessary for a bacteria a single cell bacteria to survive yeah i think that's a broad question and pretty weighted but overall each type of bacteria tends to survive in different types of environments so when we look at the different type of bacteria that are out there they all need necessarily some sort of energy source. They need to be able to feed off of something, but some of them are more heat tolerant, so do better in warm environments. Some of them are less heat tolerant, so do better in cold. Some of them are need more oxygen to survive, so they do better in high oxygen environments, and some of them can't survive in high oxygen environments, so do better in areas that don't have oxygen. So with bacteria, they're all a little bit different. And the crazy thing about bacteria is they're single cell organisms that we talk about quite a bit. But there's always some type of bacteria that can survive in almost any type of environment. So we always have to be thinking about in this current environment, we're thinking about whether it's a human host, it's a tissue, it's in your GI tract, wherever it may be, what type of bacteria can live there based off of those characteristics we describe? Because it's very different depending upon what environment we're in. So important, all of those places that you just named, because we're talking about surgical instruments, we're talking about things that are entering mucous membranes, all of those things that you just said, the GI tract and tissues, that's exactly what we're talking about now, right? So Jerry, I'm going to move to you. When we're talking about those types of things, and we're talking about SPD and the importance of pre-cleaning, the importance of how we transport our instruments to SPD and how we handle them. What does that strike in you as far as why this is so important about how we know bacteria and viruses are, are transmitted and what is the importance of making sure that we're preventing that transmission in every way that we can from OR to SPD? Prevention really does start in the OR during the case. Essentially, they should be keeping those instruments moist in some fashion and wiped off. The main thing that we're looking at is preventing biofilm formation, and that can actually occur very quickly where the cells will start to get organized and they'll start sharing information and they can duplicate and, and grow rather quickly. So then when we move to getting them down to SPD, we want to make sure that they are moist and you don't have to use an enzymatic, something as simple as a using sterile water from the back table over a towel can keep them moist. You just have to look at what your individual needs are and how long it takes to get those instruments down to SPD and into decontam. And this is so critical, especially when we start talking about biofilm formation, because this really is kind of the cutting edge of understanding pathogens and understanding, you know, antibiotic resistance really does come down to those biofilms and, Kind of the core thing that we have to keep in mind is that while those instruments are sitting on the back table, they're covered in blood, they've got that nutrient source that Patrick mentioned earlier is the need for, for energy. They've got a surface that they can attach to and they can begin to grow. So all the ingredients are there for them to continue to grow and then reach those critical levels where biofilm begins to create and then begins to create those problems. So you're absolutely right. That point of use treatment, it really does get down to the criticality of preventing that in order to prevent surgical site infections for those patients. I love talking about biofilms. And I recently listened to a podcast by Michael, actually. And, and I want to bring this up because I, I will probably never forget this, that during that podcast, they started referring to biofilms as the slime house. And I don't think I'll ever not think of it as that anymore because it it really kind of is like a little slime house all over your sink drains and it can be in your instruments. And that that is so 
critical to think of it that way, that once biofilms form, you know, it's just kind of trapping bacteria and we're going to have a, a much harder time getting rid of things like that when, when you've got a little slime house to get rid of. Yeah. And even on top of that, you know, you mentioned quorum sensing and the ability to share you know, information, DNA between the bacteria is that, you know, if you've got one bacteria in the, you know, congregation of, of biofilm in the slime house, if you will, you know, that has developed antibiotic resistance, it absolutely can and will share that antibiotic resistance with the other bacteria that may not have had that to begin with, but they will after sharing that house. <laughs> That's awesome. I just love thinking of it that way. It's like roommates. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's kind of switch gears in thinking about uh, transmission of of these things in, in sterile processing. And are we worried about transmission of these bacteria and viruses within the sterile processing unit? And I love that Patrick also brought up Hep B, Hep C, and HIV because we don't often think about those things as much as we are with what bacteria, what infection the patient had, but we're not thinking about those occupationally transmitted diseases as much as we are the the infections that cause other types of illnesses. So what what are we most worried about as far as transmission within the unit on surfaces, on just contamination of of the department? Patrick, do you want to go first? Sure. And I, I don't think I want to steal a thunder of another one of the podcasts that focuses on PPE. But I think when we think about the transmission in these environments, we really have to really go back to the, the pyramid we look at and where PPE sits there in terms of preventing our staff at that almost final line of defense. So when we think about the PPE, we get to think about ways that things can transmit. Contact is the main way that we think about transmission in these environments. You have soiled instruments, you're touching them with your hands. If you accidentally touch your face, you touch your skin, you touch some other surface that you can then transmit to yourself, that's a great pathway for transmission of these microorganisms from the instruments to you. So that's why we make sure that staff are covering their eyes, their face, all the skin, the surfaces have the gloves that go high enough, make sure that they have boot covers on in the situation that they're in a splash zone, right? These are the things that we need to do to prevent our staff. Other things we need to think about are sharps. I think the one part that gets missed a lot in CPD is that there's stuff going into these sinks that's getting put underwater that have sharps everywhere. And all it takes is one slip up that you're potentially puncturing the skin of that CPD tech who is doing the decon. And at that point, you know, that, that's the, the number one recipe for transmitting these bloodborne pathogens is through the sharp injuries that may occur. So it's really imperative that the processes are happening appropriately from the OR of removing any blades, removing sharps that are disposable at that point. When things come downstairs, the CPD tech's aware of any sharps that may be present so they can make sure they take extra caution there. And then the CPD tech is following any processes and procedures they have in place to prevent those sharps injuries, such as wearing more uh, cut resistance gloves that may be available in their department. So all those things really go into preventing these injuries, in addition to all the other environmental controls that we may have in place, such as the negative pressure in our decon areas, the deep enough sinks, making sure that everybody's pre-cleaning in the OR and such. But I could talk about this all day and I want to leave some time for other topics. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Like so much happens in decontamination and, and I go in and out of a lot of decontamination areas uh, you know, throughout my career. And, you know, it's it's not unusual to see sterile processing technicians not wearing certain pieces, particularly masks, for example, because it, it's hot, it's a heavy working environment. And so anything that kind of gets in the way of breathing is it, just discarded. But, you know, that's so dangerous because, and you can tell that, you know, they just don't have the training and the knowledge that's being covered, for example, in this podcast, because I think if you did, you would want to wear that PPE. You would beg to wear it all the time. And it's a real problem that we have to work on communicating to sterile processing technicians who oftentimes have no training whatsoever in you know, bacteria, viruses like we're talking about. And it shows in how they view their PPE. If it's just something in the way, they're going to start ignoring it. Yeah, that's so true. I think the more information and education you have on transmission of viruses, of illness in general, the more aware you are of just your own health, of how you can take it home to your kids, to your family. And I think that's what we have to really think of because a lot of times we do 
things as adults that benefit us, right? And sometimes, it, you know, when we talk to people about you need to wash your hands because it's the best thing for your patient, sometimes that's not enough. You have to really tie it back to how's it benefit you and your own family and your own needs. And so we really need to teach people the why. Why is it important to not transmit these organisms through the department and tie it back to their own whys and their own needs? And that's that's super important. And I'm going to throw this out to our guests. Something that Patrick mentioned was, you know, the environmental controls that are present in decontamination, such as negative air pressure, for example. But I think one that gets overlooked a lot is temperature control. And, you know, if you want to get people really riled up on the sterile processing community, just ask them about temperature controls and decontamination. And it's understandable why they're so passionate about it, because you're wearing this impermeable PPE. It's hot. You're doing hard work. You know, until you get sweaty, it's it's gross, it's tiring and, and all that sort of stuff. But I think one of the pieces that gets forgotten in that conversation is the reason why we want temperatures kept down in decontamination is not just for the SPD technician's comfort, but it's also to help inhibit that growth of bacteria as well. And so I don't know, maybe if you guys had any feedback on how to try to communicate that or uh, try to uh, partner with your environmental control people in, in the hospitals or any advice you could give us to help move that forward. Jerry, you want to take a stab at that one? Yeah. So when we're talking about the temperature, absolutely, people bake in decontam in particular. And, you know, like we talked about before, some of these organisms can't survive in those more extreme ends of hot and cold. But the other thing you need to consider is the humidity level. And that can play a component in how hot you feel and how different bacteria would be able to thrive in that area. So it is a balance between the two. And it is really important to communicate this with not only the OR staff and, and those up there, up in the, you know, that arena, but also with your facilities and making sure that you're within the correct parameters and making sure that you guys are able to function safely while controlling any organisms that may thrive in those extreme environments. Patrick, I'm going to throw it to you. Have you had any success with using that rationale that Michael presented or just success in general with getting temperatures lowered for your sterile processing team? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think one of the challenges we have here in the Northeast is a lot of our facilities are older. They're they're urban facilities and they've been in place for quite a few years. So when we look back at the FGI guidelines for developing hospitals, over the years, we've had a big change in terms of what the requirements are for temp and humidity monitoring and control within these spaces. So newer facilities, we actually just had one open last year, which was fantastic with the new CPD. We can control that temperature inside the parameters of the FGI guidelines, and it makes it nice and easy to, to keep a temperature in the range we want for comfort and for the, the micro, microbial growth, as we discussed. The older facilities sometimes have more challenges staying within those more modern ranges. I think it's, it's important to note, to Jerry's point, humidity is another consideration, but when you look at the FGI guidelines even currently, there's nothing listed for humidity parameters within the decon area that's only in the prep and pack and the sterile stores areas. So many of our facilities have monitoring that's required, but to ask somebody to do some additional monitoring outside of a required area is tough. So it definitely comes down to using this knowledge that we're sharing here to leverage that with your facilities and maintenance folks to make sure that you have a plan to maintain a comfortable environment for staff and an environment that inhibits growth as best as possible. That's such a good point that even if something's not required or even if you're operating at the very top of the range of the temperature guidelines, which I've used this several times to say, yeah, we're in range, but we're at the very top mark of the range. And that's still not acceptable. It's still too hot. And I will actually invite folks from facilities and from around the the hospital to come in with me, put all the gear on and actually work in there for a while and see how hot it gets. And some, and of course, usually they don't want to. So when I go in there and do it, I will take pictures of how sweaty I am when I'm done and say, well, this is what it looks like when you're done. And, and that is how hot you get. And so it, 
it really would be great if facilities and some other folks, and, and if your IPs have never come with you into decontaminate, actually worked for a couple hours, invite them to do that because to actually do that and to sweat off half your body weight, which is what I always say that I do when I work in decontam, it, it is definitely eye-opening to how hard it is and to how much your back hurts afterwards and your feet hurt and everything in your body hurts for days when you're not used to doing that. So invite your IP to come down and do like a half day observing with you in decontam and it will definitely turn them into your best advocate for temperature, humidity and everything else in decontam. So I highly encourage you to ask them to do that. Okay, so changing gears just a little bit, I want to ask the question about surgical site infections. And we all know that we're monitoring positive microbiology reports for this. And what do you think is something that we would be most concerned with in regards to a sterile processing failure in regards to surgical site infections? What would kind of tip you off to say, oh, we need to look at the sterile processing process for this one. Yeah, I think the the question about tracing back SSIs to CPD is a really difficult one because there is no great way that we can say microbiologically we trace this from point A to point B to the, the point of the surgical site infection. And so a lot of it really comes down to looking at processes. And I think anyone that knows me and anyone that talks to me, I talk about the Donabedian model for healthcare quality all the time, how we have our structure, processes, and outcomes with the infections being the outcomes. So let's take a step back and look at these processes that can lead to the outcomes. So one thing that we tend to do, and I've tended to do in my career is, okay, we think we have an SSI issue. We've identified one or two or a blip or whatever you want to call that increase that it caught your attention. Where do you go from there? And I think it's really going and doing observations of the processes, starting at the bedside, right? Going into the OR, doing your observations, seeing how instruments are being cared for at the bedside, and doing a tracer, really, following those instruments down to CPD. How long do they wait till they get to decon? Are they staying wet that whole time? When they get to decon, are people pulling up the IFUs to see how they're supposed to decon these instruments and run them through that process? And then follow them along the full step of the way to kind of see, is everything happening the way it should? At that point, you get an idea of if anything may be being missed, that may be an area for corrective action, which is always helpful to see. And then when you go into prep and pack, making sure that things are being inspected properly on that side but before they're being put in their kit and put into the sterilizer at the proper parameters. And I think doing that whole process allows you to say, okay, we've identified an area for improvement that could potentially contribute to SSIs. There is no great way that's uh, agreed upon to say this definitely led to these SSIs in the absence of a true outbreak, right, that we talked about before. So I think that's an area that we try to leverage here and make sure that CPD knows they're part of the process and that they're a really important part of the process, even if I can't point a finger and say these 30% of SSIs are what you contributed to. And just to tack on to what Patrick was saying, and and in the world of infection prevention, we really talk about bundles. And so I think of that as an umbrella with a bunch of holes in it. And you're trying to put a cork in each of those holes so that an infection doesn't happen to that one person. So SPD and all the things that they bring to the patient safety world is a lot of those plugs in many steps of what they're doing. So in the big picture, like Patrick was saying, it's very difficult to pinpoint, but the more of those holes we can close, the safer the patient will be. Boy, that's fantastic. Uh, and I, I just love the idea of get get into the process, follow the process. If you've listened to any of our stuff in the past, it, we are all about audits, you know, following the process to find the problems. Because the reality is, is that nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh boy, today's the day I'm going to, you know, spread uh, pseudomonas to a, to this patient. Or, you know, like I can't wait, you know, today's the day that I get to infect a whole bunch of people with CRE or something, you know, like, no, like nobody wants to do those things. And the reality is, is that when they happen, it's almost always a process flaw. And you aren't going to know what those opportunities are until you get in and watch that process. And so I love, I love it when audits come up. That's great. And just like with many of our hospital acquired infections that we look at, it's really difficult to ever say one thing contributed to any of our infections or one thing prevented 
all of our infections. So infection prevention is such a, a tough world because we never just implement one thing for prevention and we hardly ever can pinpoint the one thing that caused infection. So it's such a great point that you you do have to just watch processes and identify things that could prevent or could have caused and just make sure you're doing everything you can to improve those processes. So I'm going to wrap up this session with one of the tougher conversations about what to do when this happens. And I'm going to start with Patrick and ask him to just give us kind of a high level overview of what is CJD and why is it so tough when you have a CJD patient in the operating room? Absolutely. Yeah, I'll try to keep this as high level as possible. I think CJD, before we talk about CJD specifically, we can take a step back and talk about prions. So we talked about bacteria and viruses. Prions are for a lack of a better term, a type of protein. And it's a protein that is very resistant to multiple forms of disinfection and sterilization. So that's really the reason, to Jill, your point, we get so concerned when a patient has to go to the OR that may be a suspect for or later is confirmed to have CJD. For anyone that's in infection prevention, this is not something that you ever want to have to deal with in your career, to be quite honest. You would want to have policies and procedures in place to try to prevent this whenever possible. One of the things that is is difficult with these prion diseases is that many times they are transmitted most readily via brain tissue, eye tissue, spinal cord tissue, and a little lesser so cerebral spinal fluid. So those are the areas we start thinking about for concern. If you need to bring a patient to the OR who is either suspect or is confirmed CJD, it is technically recommended against most of the time, but in the event it has to happen and the clinical team decide they have to do it, the institution needs to have a process in place to really dispose of any of the equipment that's utilized for these procedures. And when it's disposed, it has to go through a process that will be incinerated because it cannot go into your normal waste stream. So there's a lot of pre-planning that needs to go in place for that. I would recommend from my perspective that every facility have their own process predefined for in the event that something like this were to occur, that you're ready to make sure that everything enters the proper waste stream and to make sure that these instruments do not go back to CPD. Because if they're reprocessed our normal way that we reprocess instruments, we cannot guarantee that they will truly be sterile and free from any prions on the instruments, which then could lead for further transmission down the line. I think the one scary thing with prions from my perspective is that any sort of outcome is not always readily available. These prions can lay dormant for some time and then they can rear their head months, years, whatever it may be down the line. So we really have to zone in on those processes we discussed earlier and make sure that we're following the proper steps to avoid any of these potential exposures from occurring. Yeah, and you're you're absolutely right. Prions are a, a nightmare scenario for any place. But one thing I, I do want everybody to understand is that while it's super, super rare, it does happen. And if you are in an infection prevention group or if you are even following, you know, some of the general sterile processing groups, every now and then someone will pop up and they'll say, hey, we had a CJD, you know, what, what, what should we do? And the reality is if it's already happened, it's too late at that point. You have to be prepared on the front end. And so if you don't have a CJD policy, get one. You need to have one because by the time it happens, it's too late. And that's almost like one of your SPD emergency management type situations that, like you said, it's too late if you're not already prepared. So you need to be prepared for that. And there there are a few things in sterile processing that you need to be prepared for. And, and I would consider some of those things like disaster management, like water main breaks, steam failures, boiler failures. It, that's almost like your own type of disaster management playbooks that in SPD, you have to be ready ahead of time because nothing is scarier than if you have a CJD patient and you have no idea what you're supposed to do. But like you said, you don't want to be posting on a message board and asking what to do because by that time, you're out of luck because you have already missed your shot. Jerry, any last thoughts about CJD or scary pathogens that you'd like to share with the audience as we wrap up here? You know, for me, the the main thing and prions aside is that treat every set that you are working with as if it's infected with something. Don't ever assume that 
this person was without MRSA or without some other, you know, resistant organism or something. Just treat it the same. Get into that muscle memory. Wear your PPE appropriately. And a lot of times that's, that's what's going to keep you safe. Perfect. And with that, we are out of time for this episode. The time flew by. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you to our guests, Jerry and Patrick, and to my co-host, Michael. And we will see you next time. Thanks for listening. All right. That was our episode on bacteria, viruses, funguses, and even prions with Jerry and Patrick. And boy, that was a fantastic conversation that we were having. And I love that it's just a a high level overview of understanding our enemies. And I mean, this really is what it comes down to in sterile processing is, you know, it's our job to prevent those bacteria, those viruses from ever affecting patients. And you're gonna be a lot more effective at that if you understand who you're fighting, what you're fighting and, and all those opportunities. And I felt like this was a really good high level conversation to kind of give us a primer in understanding what is the risk associated with these dangerous critters. Yeah, awesome. And we dove a little bit into the CJD patients and why is that scary? And what do we need to know about that? And what do we need to be prepared for? And kind of treating that like its own emergency management plan, because if you don't prepare for it ahead of time, you're going to be too late once it happens. And we also talked about how we can involve sterile processing processes in the overall SSI investigation and how we really just need to look for ways to prevent SSIs and improve processes because you may not be able to pinpoint that one single thing that caused an SSI, but you can pinpoint some areas for improvement that we know are going to improve our safety for our patients, which is why we're all here in the first place. Thank you all for joining this episode and thank you to my co-host, Michael, and to our guests, Jerry and Patrick. Don't forget to wash your hands and keep fighting dirty. Thanks for tuning in to this exclusive podcast series on pathogens and PPE. For more information and clinical resources to help you fight dirty, make sure to follow us on social media by searching for Beyond Clean and Transmission Control.